this time on the Nivlac 57 YouTube channel, it's 180 degree header versus equal length, small engine versus big engine, Chevy versus uh, Studebaker? Father's car versus son's car. You pay for the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. Alright guys, it's been a minute. Today you're going to see us dyno my 1963 Studebaker, which you saw us swap with a Gen 5 L83, a TKX 5-speed, and we've already run this car at the track. And today we are in the search for optimizing this combination. Now, if you guys saw the video where we ran this car at the track, you will know that I was a little bit disappointed with the performance. So the goal for today was hopefully we would see some pretty big gains. To briefly go over the combo, it is a Gen 5 L83 5.3 liter out of a 2015 Silverado. That is almost completely stock other than I swapped in a LT2 camshaft from a C8 Corvette and I put on this LT2 intake also from a C8 Corvette that was modified by Mast Motorsports to add port injection. I built a set of stainless 180 degree headers for the build and it gives it kind of a unique sound. Now, as you guys know, I re-engineered the entire front of this car to suit the 180 degree headers, and that should be really fun to listen to while it is on the dyno. So without further ado, let's hear it. Because you had figured it out by your track times. It's within one horsepower what we both said it would make at the wheel. <laughs> you tell me that shit ain't on the money. <laughs> yeah, you told me that before. You yeah. said, I remember you saying 330. Yeah. And literally to the number. <laughs> That's pretty badass, man. When you can literally go to track and then come here and be like, I already know what it's gonna make. <laughs> that well, says awesome. a lot about how much energy you got put into that spreadsheet. Damn right. right. <laughs> I made that spreadsheet. I started making that spreadsheet. Okay. 1980. Right. So when did and you start dynoing cars, Andy? What year? We could only dyno engines. Engines, okay. And we take the engine, we put it in the car, and it would run. So you didn't start dynoing cars till Chassis like dynos? recently. Oh, heck no. That wasn't yeah. until 94. Okay. I got that one soon. Okay. But I made that chart, it started around 1980, and I finished that chart in 1990. It took me 10 years to make that chart. Okay. Just based on the curve. Okay. That's great. I hadn't I had even thought about that. <laughs> it's pretty wild, though. Yeah. I mean, I call them when they attend. I, I tell people what they're going to run in the track, and they're right there. Yeah. Is that why you call them so long? Yeah. <laughs> it's because of you guys, though, you know. It dynoing and thinking and adjusting and, and just, it, you know, utilizing, you know, tools that are available and, and, and thinking outside the box with it. People don't realize, what I think people don't realize, dude, if you have a car that actually puts 500 horsepower to the tire, holy crap, that's fast. You're going fast, baby. <laughs> like everybody thinks it takes an 800 horsepower car. Not even close, dude. You got 800? You probably ain't got a big enough tire to make it go. <laughs> you don't have to know. No clue. No clue. This guy's out here all 500. I said, dude, 
You don't got any idea. That is a stout car. <laughs> It took quite a few pulls where we played around with the fueling, injection timing, variable valve timing, and ignition timing, but eventually we got to a optimal number of 352 horsepower. That was a gain of around 20 wheel horsepower, but what you don't see is the area under the curve. What we actually found is that the engine actually likes a uh, ignition timing ramp with RPM. It actually likes a lower, uh, around 26 degrees, around 5,000 RPMs, and to be ramped to over 30 degrees of ignition timing at higher RPM. This was very surprising to me just because we've done a lot of LS stuff in the past and they normally like, um, you know, in the lower 20s to high 20s of ignition timing. And we just did not see that with this particular combo. Now, my goals for the day were to see quite a bit more of a horsepower gain than just 20 horsepower. And because of that, I am pretty well convinced that this naturally aspirated engine is not going to meet my goals of a 10.00 in the quarter mile. So in the future, we're going to have to look to um, some other avenues to add a little bit of horsepower. Now, we could throw more camshaft at it, but then I might have to fly cut my pistons and change out my valve springs and my push rods and things get really expensive um, pretty quick there. So I feel like a better way to spend the money would be to add a little bit of forced induction. But I don't want to get rid of my headers. So that should pretty well narrow down where we are headed with this project. So look forward to that. But wait, there's more. We also dynoed my dad's 1974 Nova, which you see sitting next to me here. Now, you guys haven't seen this car on the channel in quite a while, and the last time that you guys saw it, it had twin turbos. But recently, my dad decided that he wanted to do some more index style racing with this car, and turbos just aren't very consistent for that type of work. So we took the de-stroked 6 liter that was in the car out and we installed a LS3 6.2 liter into the car. So it will be kind of fun to see how this Gen 4 6.2 liter compares to my Gen 5 5.3 liter. Now granted, this Gen 4 engine has quite a few more upgrades than my 5.3 liter does. So let's go over those mods quickly right now. This engine came out of a Camaro. It is a stock bottom end. We installed a 613 lift comp cam into it. That is designed for naturally aspirated use, has a very tight lobe separation angle, as I'm sure you're gonna hear in the video. It has a set of mildly ported heads by our buddies at Snyder Performance, upgraded valve springs and retainers, some upgraded push rods, and 
that's about it. We installed the same intake that we were running when it had the turbos, which is a Edelbrock Victor Jr. with a Holley EFA uh, carb elbow. And we also installed the inch and seven eighths uh, equal length, rotationally timed headers onto the car that we were running on the car back when it was supercharged. So enough blabbering, let's get onto the dyno. It took quite a few pulls to get this combo dialed in, and overall my impressions were it actually sounds way better than I thought it would. Also we found out that it took way more ignition timing than what uh, me or Dustin, the dyno operator, <laughs> were expecting. Uh, frankly my dad was pretty much spot on the money, and we ended up in the low uh, 30s of ignition timing. We basically did all of the same um, tests that we did with my Studebaker on this engine, except we didn't have cam timing to play with. And overall, it was a pretty interesting day. So if we look at both of the engines that we dyno today from a volumetric efficiency standpoint, what we find is that the uh, Gen 4 engine with quite a healthy cam and ported heads made 1.21 wheel horsepower per cubic inch. The Gen 5 engine, on the other hand, while it had a, a more efficient drivetrain, it also had a much more mild cam and head setup, and it only made 1.07 wheel horsepower per cubic inch. So it would be very interesting to see uh, how a Gen 5 engine would perform with a much more aggressive camshaft, and we plan to do just that in the future with the 76 Nova build that we are working on slowly in the background. That car will have a 6.2 liter LT with a much more aggressive cam, thanks to our friends at Brian Tooley Racing. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a teaser out there and tell you guys to look forward to that. So which do you guys like more? Do you like the equal length setup or do you like the 180 degree header setup? Frankly, I liked them both. One much more than I thought I would, but I'm interested to see what you guys have to say down in the comments.